Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Bill Adams, if any of you don't know, and I am one of the Bible study teachers here at the church. Tonight we're going to talk about a subject that is as broad as it is important to every aspect of our lives. Because to be honest, how could I possibly keep from singing? I've been playing music for almost 50 years. And I remember clearly the first time I sat down to the piano after watching my mom play it. And um, The music has always been there for me. And we're going to talk about a little bit of science. I hope you guys are okay with that. And I want you to uh, make sure if you haven't done it, that you silence your cell phones and have a pen ready to write down any questions that you might have because we are going to have the Q&A at the end. We're going to start off with a word of prayer. If I could get you to bow your heads, please. Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come, who created the universe and everything that in it is. Lord God, we thank you and we praise you for everything that you have made, all the gifts that you have given to us, not the least of which is what we're going to discuss tonight. God, I pray that you would bless the words of my mouth, that they would carry you forth, God in the power of your spirit, and the truth of your word. God, and I pray that the ears would be open, the hearts prepared to hear it, whether we're in this building or far away, online or across time, to someone that is hearing the recording of this. Lord God, that all would be for your glory in the name of Jesus. Amen. So, we're going to start off with the science. I love the science. And I, I love the science because it just ties together everything else. Because the Bible says that uh, Jesus Christ was before all things, and in him all things consist. And that word consist, if you, you can look it up later. But that word consist literally means held together. God created everything. Genesis 1, Genesis 2, and he said that it's all good. We're going to start off looking at, uh, look at uh, Job. Chapter 38, as we're talking about science. I hope you don't mind, I'm using my electronic Bible. And in Job 38, verses 4 through 7, God is speaking to Job. And he says, where wast thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare it, if you have understanding. Who hath laid the measures thereof, if thou knowest? Or who hath stretched the line upon it? Whereupon are the foundations thereof fast fastened? Or who laid the cornerstone thereof, when the morning stars sang together, and all of the sons of God shouted for joy? The angels sang at creation along with the morning stars. And people will say that that's just a metaphor of some sort, but the fact of the matter is that we can tell how far away a star is. We can tell how big a star is by the transmissions that come from it. 
we measure them, and the light waves are the same exact thing as sound waves. This also tells us that it's not just in our world where there is music, but in the spiritual realm, because the angels are singing. There are many other uh, examples of that in scripture that we're not going to go to tonight because frankly, I could spend the next six hours talking about music. Every element vibrates with a measurable and specific frequency. And in fact, uh, I don't know if any of you who were in the military are aware of this, but there are some times when an army is marching across a bridge that they stop marching in cadence and they're told to march across it without cadence because the stomping, the regular stomping of the foot could literally cause that bridge to vibrate apart at the wrong frequency. But isn't it a lot easier to march when you have a cadence going on? And honestly, there are many things that we live with in the day-to-day world that have their own song. Jim's not here tonight, but the sound of that Harley is probably music to his ears. It's not just a saying. It really is. Personally, there are a lot of nights that I... uh, I'm going to sleep and I listen to the sound of the dishwasher running in the kitchen. You know, that it's, it's not a regular rhythm, but it's sort of a regular rhythm. But it's constant. And it's harmonious. And any of you that have been on a ship, tell me, do you feel the engine through the deck plates? Yeah. It's, it's a fact. Of, it's a fact. And uh, I want to, I just want to, Add one more if I could. The sitting around a campfire and listening to it just crackle away. And it's not an even rhythm, but it's still music. And then what happens? Out in the darkness, there's a sharp crack of a stick as someone steps on it. What happens? Immediately your attention is grabbed. You forget about the music for a moment. Or the hum of the engine of your car changes. Or the dishwasher starts grinding. And you're already in bed listening to it and you're immediately attentive. Why is it doing that? What's going wrong? What needs to be dealt with? And you probably feel the change in the vibration of the deck plates before the ship pitches over to one side to make a turn. And everybody on that ship is thinking, why are we stopping? Why are we turning? And even so, the lack of that harmonious sound called music is disharmony. It's tension. And whether it's physical or only mental, we feel it. If you're having an off day, going to work, doing the same job that you do every other day, but there's something off in your mind and you just can't seem to focus. So is this a bad thing? Well, in and of itself, no. Think about its place in the universe. What is that noise doing, that disharmony? It's alerting you. Just like a pain in your body tells you something is wrong. Just like hunger moves you to go and eat something. Weariness moves you to go to bed and sleep. Thirst. All of these things alert your brain that there's something that's not in harmony. And the point of that is you are motivated to do what? 
return to harmony, right? So you're not going to continue driving the car down the road or trying to drive the car down the road when the transmission appears to have stopped shifting. Am I speaking from experience? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> but the point is that even disharmony has its place in creation. Noise. So the noise of a battle. What about the noise of music, the sound of music? Is that ever something that causes tension? Well, yeah, yep. How about in Daniel chapter three, and we won't go to it right now and read, but because we're still kind of talking about science, but where the music of Nebuchadnezzar heralded everyone to bow and worship the throne, the uh, golden image, excuse me, that he had made. Open up your Bibles to Proverbs 25.20. We'll just look at that one real quick. Because it's short. It says, as he that taketh away a garment in cold weather, and as vinegar upon nitre, so is he that singeth songs to a heavy heart. Music has the ability to hurt as well as to help. There is a whole branch of science that is dedicated to utilizing music for therapy for people who are of a heavy heart. Because when people hear that music and their heart returns to harmony, their body begins to return to harmony. And things that were broken heal themselves noticeably more quickly. All because God has created music in all of its forms and has given it to men. When he created man, he gave us authority and a position to subdue everything in nature didn't he? And that includes music. And not everybody uses music for good. We're going to go next to uh, Ezekiel chapter 28. And I'm going to read you some verses here. Verses 11 through 15. <laughs> And this is Ezekiel speaking, and he said, Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God, Thou sealest up this sum, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering, the sardius, topaz, and the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, and the jasper the sapphire, the emerald, and the carbuncle, and gold, the workmanship of thy tabrets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou wast created. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created till iniquity was found in thee. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but I want to point out a few things. First of all, if you read the rest of this chapter, it will become evident to you that this is not a mortal king. 
that God is talking about to Ezekiel. He was in Eden. He is the anointed cherub that covereth. He's an angel. And God set him so. On the holy mountain of God, thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. But in addition to all of his other beauty, the workmanship of thy tabrets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou was created. God gave him music. Tabrets, the tambourine. Pipes would be the flute. And he fell. And since then, he still has music and the ability to use it. What does he do with everything he touches? Satan corrupts it. The Bible says he's the liar and the father of it. And there's no truth in him. But we have music that is used not just for praising God, but also for things just that pertain to our life. There was singing and dancing and celebration when David returned from the slaughter of the Philistines. In fact, the women sang, Saul has slain his thousands and David his ten thousands. And that set off a whole situation because that music was used to create jealousy in Saul. Now, why did it set up jealousy in Saul? Without going to that scripture, I'm going to tell you that he said his reaction to that song was, what more can he have but the kingdom? And when he heard other people singing that of David, he decided in his own mind that David was on a path to take the kingdom away from him. Oblivious to the fact that God had already decided to take it from him and give it to David. It was above his pay grade. But what conclusion did he reach? That he was at the top of his pay grade. That there wasn't anybody telling him what to do. We look at uh, Luke chapter 15. The entire family, with the exception of one brother, rejoiced with music and dancing when the prodigal son returned home. So we know day-to-day -day life, not only do we have music, but the music is useful, it's good. If it wasn't, no one would ever get to sing happy birthday to you again. It's beneficial, right? Lullabies, movie soundtracks. There's a really good example right there, movie soundtracks. Because what do they do? They take you down with the action. They take you up with the action. They take you down into suspense. They make you look for what's happening next. I will not sing the Jaws theme. I promised myself I wouldn't. But when you hear those two notes back and forth on the veal, you're looking for a fish. Apparently there was no orchestra when Jonah was thrown overboard. They make us feel heroic when the hero finally springs out and thwarts evil and saves the day. Just in a movie soundtrack, you can see the entire range of musical effect on the mind and the body. If you hear that psycho theme, you can't help it. You're not going in there and pulling that shower curtain apart. You're not going to do it. And 
I say that. I say, now I'm going to tell you this. You may not believe me. I'm going to tell you that having never seen the movie Psycho. Never saw it. But the music causes that, what we call an archetypal response. You can't help it. If I say, ba da ba ba ba, even if you don't sing it out loud, your brain is saying, I'm loving it, whether you do or don't. Tell me I'm wrong. Well, maybe just you. <laughs> but we hear these things every day. They're in the world that we live. And you can't really get away from it. Now, what I've just talked about God allows and understands that there's music in this world for our enjoyment. We enjoy music because it is a gift. James chapter one says, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights with whom is no variableness and neither shadow of turning. And so music of itself is not good or bad. Now, when I say that, I'll refer back to the music therapy that I mentioned earlier, where there's some music that doctors actually use for people to listen to this music that actually helps them to heal. And it helps them to quiet their minds. When, I, when I'm working, has anybody else ever turned on uh, brown noise when you're working? There's also white noise. They, they call it different colors, but you can actually get an app on your phone that will play noise that is at specific frequencies that is known to quiet the mind or wake it up and help it to focus. And I will also tell you that, without having time to go into much detail, that there are chords, chord progressions that are used in songs by ungodly people that do the opposite to the human mind. There is a type of music that is called uh, trance music, and it's got a close cousin called house music, and the entire point of that music is to cause you to stop thinking. And the higher brain functions are actually dampened by these chords, by these frequencies, to cause you to lean more on the animal and instinctive sides of your behavior. but it is still music. So tell me something. I want you to think about this for a second. And as a human being, if you were going into a building and they were playing music that you knew was going to cause you to be susceptible to the influence of others, Literally. Would you go into that building? Or wouldn't you? Kids are being lured in to these places for parties, and they don't know. But if you knew, would you do it? Well, most of us here are adults, and uh, I'm guessing that you would say no, as I would. But when I'm driving Uber... I've got smooth jazz on in the car. Why? Because it's got a very positive effect on any of my passengers. Little children, go to sleep. 
people whose mind is already severely under the influence of alcohol quiet down. And it's absolutely true. Absolutely true. I have had, in five years, I have had maybe two people ask me to turn the music off, but nobody's ever told me they don't like it. The comment is usually exactly the opposite. It makes them feel good. And the chords, the people who write that music, design it that way. Why? Because that's how they sell records. That's how they sell music. But the important part of all of this is coming up. Now, I said a few moments ago that if you were not aware of the effects that music was going to have on you, would you listen to it? Would you put yourself in that situation? No, because most of you, as I said, are adults. You have the ability to discern healthy from not healthy, good from evil. And quite frankly, we're seeing a lot of people in our society as a whole that is seriously lacking in that discernment. Jesse shared previously, and we're going to go to it now, if you'll open up your Bibles to James chapter 3. Starting in verse 14, or let's go backwards to 13. Who is a wise man and endued with knowledge among you? Let him show out of a good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom. But if ye have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not, and lie not against the truth. This wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, devilish. For where envying and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. It's about the message. Now, when I said I'm playing smooth jazz in the car, it's instrumental. And if something comes on that has words, and uh, I, I am immediately alert. Why? Because just as there is tension created by sounds that are out of harmony, the message of that music creates instant disharmony with the higher functions of my brain. Because God has allowed me some knowledge, some wisdom. Let's look at Psalm 97, verse 10 real quick. And it says, ye that love the Lord, hate evil. He preserveth the souls of his saints. He delivereth them out of the hand of the wicked. Light is sown for the righteous and gladness for the upright in heart. Rejoice in the Lord, ye righteous, and give thanks at the remembrance of his holiness. Now, what are the, what are the admonitions that are given here? If you love the Lord, hate evil. Doesn't say hate evil people. It says hate evil. It says rejoice in the Lord, ye righteous. Give thanks at the remembrance of his holiness. There's also a proverb uh, eight thirteen. Sometimes you just have to endure it. I'll turn to it really quick, although I'm running out of time. Proverbs 8, 13, the fear of the Lord 
is to hate evil. Pride and arrogancy and the evil way and the froward mouth do I hate. And that is the fear of the Lord. Now we're going to go to Colossians chapter 3. We're going to read more than a couple of verses in this chapter because it really sews all of these things together. And beginning in verse 1, If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Verse 2 is, Set your affection on things above, not things on the earth. It doesn't say to ignore the things that are on the earth, but you set your affection on the things that are above. When one of those songs comes on that's not instrumental on the smooth jazz station, when I've got a passenger in the car, I have a dump button that goes, that switches over to the hard drive that's in my, in my radio and it, and it plays something else that I already know is instrumental instead. Now, if I don't have a passenger in the car, well, frankly, I'm not listening to smooth jazz. I switch the station over when I get a passenger that goes in the car. Why? Because that's not really what I set my affection on. You know, if I'm, if I'm playing, 90% of the time I'm playing something that we do up here. On occasion, I've had reason for family or for work to do something that wasn't specifically a godly song. But I got it done and dealt with it and put it away. And you don't hear me play it except that uh, I'll sometimes play a couple pieces of classical music up here to warm up, such as... uh, Box, uh, not Bach, uh, Paco Bell's Canon in D. Classical music, most people don't even know, was mostly originally written for the church. And it was played in the church. And it was written with that intent. So that So it's uplifting. But... But ye are dead, he says in verse 3, and your life is hid with Christ in God. And we'll skip down to 5. Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection. Do you know what that is, inordinate affection? It means loving something that you shouldn't. Evil concupiscence. Now, concupiscence is a complicated way of saying desire. And covetousness, which is idolatry. For which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience. And we'll scroll down a little bit to verse 12. Put on therefore as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, Kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so do also, so also do ye. And above all these things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. Verse 15 is the important one. This is the takeaway. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And there's another scripture that goes along with it, which is also, which is also, written by Paul in the book of Ephesians. 
and that is Ephesians chapter 5, verse 19. And I'm going to back up a little bit here to verse 17. Wherefore, be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. And be not drunk with wine, wherein there is success, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we have two admonitions here from Paul. First of all, first of all, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns, and spiritual songs. What you put into your body and put into your mind determine the quality of your physical and your spiritual life, respectively. And when you do that, then you will be able to. Colossians 3.16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, then you can teach and admonish one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. I have been at a huge disadvantage lately because I suddenly found myself needing to speak to, admonish, encourage, and teach other people and I didn't know the words to the hymns and spiritual songs because I just been I had just been playing the music. I'll leave you with this. Music itself is not specific. It's like painting it's it's like a, a painting with colors but not photorealistic. The words, that message, that's what writes on your heart. The music can be very nice and uplifting, but all it's gonna uplift is your emotions. That message, that message written up here, that is what is gonna keep you. Is that a harmonious sound? (laughs) It is. And what we're tasked with is the discernment by the grace of God, following after peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see God. That discernment in our own lives and in what we share with other people is what's gonna prevent us from the influence of worldly music. It's not gonna be direct. It's going to just kind of nudge you off to the side. And that is all that I have to say about that and I am ready for some questions. If you have any questions.